Hello and welcome to The Geeks Review, I'm Joshua. I'm Ben. And I'm Royce. Today we're talking about Doctor Who. Doctor Who is a long-running science fiction TV series about an alien time lord called The Doctor, who travels through space and time in their ship, the TARDIS, saving the day and usually joined by a companion or assistant. The Doctor has the ability to regenerate when they reach the end of their life, where they change their appearance and personality. This has allowed many different actors to play the character across the show's 57-year history, from Tom Baker to David Tennant and currently Jodie Whittaker, perhaps best known from the crime drama Broadchurch. She's joined by three companions, Ryan played by Tosin Cole, Yasmin played by Mandip Gill, and Graham played by The Chasers' Bradley Walsh. This series is produced by Chris Chibnall of Broadchurch and is the second in three years since Jodie's run began. Jodie's first series was a departure from the tone and structure of the previous seasons and was a bit hit and miss, at least took chances. And this series is more of a return to the series' staples. The finale is airing tonight on ABC One at 7.30 and it's currently available to watch on iview along with the first nine episodes. We're going to talk spoilers in our review about those first eight to nine episodes and we'll leave episode 10 untouched, mostly because Ben hasn't seen it yet. Yeah, it's still in progress. Josh and I have seen it, so uh, but we'll keep it minimal so you can all watch it and enjoy it tonight. So the series begins with a two-parter spyfall. Uh, it begins with all these British spies being attacked by these glowing aliens and after the Doctor and companions are brought in by this government, uh, mysterious government agency played by a uh, very underused Stephen Fry. He's assassinated and they run to the Australian outback and come in contact with a British agent called O, played by Sasha Dewan. They discover the aliens have a connection to a tech company CEO, played by Lenny Henry, but as they go to confront him, O reveals himself to be the Master, a fellow Time Lord and one of the Doctor's oldest foes. The Doctor is then sent back in time, rubbing shoulders with uh, Ada Lovelace and various other characters from history, while the main crew try to figure out where she went and what's going on. It's an interesting opening. It is. Uh, it's really weird for me. Like, oh, particularly with the first episode, I'm like, okay, so it's going to be like a spy movie. I, I, I can go with that. But then we see these creatures, and I'm like, okay, these are either dimension creatures or aliens. Either way, they don't mix well with spy themes, in mm. my opinion. It didn't sit right with me. It just felt like they were just chucking in random ideas. Second part, okay, so they're going with this again. Gallifrey's destroyed again. Well, we've kind of already done that. Why, why do we have to go through it again? I, I felt like they were just recycling old ideas. I don't know why. It's just, it just put me off really bad. I looked at it and went, cool, spies. Aliens and Spice, that is an interesting idea to mix in, and it devolves into something so stupid. Really? <laughs> I found it to be absolutely stupid because you had the idea of aliens killing Spy and slowly embedding themselves mm. on planet Earth. Then the Master shows, I'm like, alright, okay, here we go. This is, you know, mm. Master's there, he's undoubtedly got some thing up his sleeve. Ooh, matter compression. Awesome. Going back to style. Yeah, lots of uh, ties back to the original series. The episode devolves into the Master's going to destroy the human race by using the uh, aliens that he's teamed up with. Yeah, the aliens sort of fall by the wayside to the they point fall where... by the wayside so much, it's insulting. It's it's a lot of setup for something which doesn't really have much of a payoff. No. Because I can't actually tell you... It's terrible, we probably should have rewatched the episode, but I can't exactly tell you what the companions got up to and what the alien plot was. What they did? And I sort of felt like they were going to come back. And then they got stuck in modern day Earth, went on the lamb because the big bad of the modern side, the human side, is so powerful he's able to, you know, put out an amber alert on these three and make them public enemies number one, two, and three. Yeah. And it, it just... It didn't feel like it had as much weight as previous, but I think no, it no. makes up for it with the introduction of the Master. He That's does... all it was. It was the stage to reintroduce the Master. And he's really different i mean he does have elements of previous masters but he's very manic he has a nice he's like a nice foil to jody uh, as the doctor yeah. and sort of makes her feel like she's in legitimate danger for once uncertainty he doesn't play it as the mustache twirler he's genuinely unhinged mm. which harkens back to the deadly assassin yes definitely personally i think the master remind me a lot too much of uh, evil matt smith he does doctor. Oh, very i've heard much a so. lot of that actually you look at the suit it's pretty much the same really blow <laughs> yeah. for blow but how he acts and even the intro where he start simultaneously slowly went through each 
major personality trait of the previous incarnations, mm. the the cunning of Delgado, Ainley sort of, come on, you can do better. It's an interesting incarnation when he finally gets out onto his own. What did you think about the Master's TARDIS as a house? <laughs> oh, some outback shack. Um, okay, it's a step up from the column and the grandfather clock. <laughs> Yeah, because the TARDIS, it's a ship that's bigger on the inside and it's got a chameleon circuit so it can change its appearance to blend into its surroundings. But the Doctor's is the shape of a police box because it's stuck that way and it's easier to market. Whereas much easier to market. Pretty much. This is something that's been really talked about but we've never recently seen that. And this season as a whole, but even that, just seeing it take the shape of a building like that to blend in, I think it's, it's really cool to see that finally, to really see that explored. Well, my question is, why does the inside still look like an outback house then? I think he must have like, changed the desktop or something, because, you know, they make references to, like, the desktop theme of the inside, so I reckon he would have changed that. And there's a few elements within that shack which do have ties back to a TARDIS. Like, there is a central table, which, when you find out this is a TARDIS, you're like, that makes sense. That's, like, the central console. Yeah, it's playing into the whole spy gimmick that he's trying to pull off. Mm. Uh, okay. Yeah, the infiltration. Yeah. Yeah, the blending in. Interesting plot ideas that didn't really go anywhere. That's the issue with Spyfall. I think it does something really good as well as it travels back and we do meet some important historical oh. figures. There's um, an interesting moment, though, Nazi-occupied um, Paris, where the master disguises himself as a Nazi commander. An SS officer. And even the doctor sort of points out, like, you don't look like the ideal Nazi, and he's using all these like disguising, you know, disguises, perception his perception filter. filters, and that to blend in. And towards the end, she rips that off him, and then basically throws him to the Nazis and makes a comment about how his his appearance isn't going to gel too well. Yikes, Doctor! What did you just do? I know he's the master, but he, yeah. Orphan Fifty Five. Graham finds a winner's ticket to a vacation at a luxury. I'm going to say interplanetary spa hmm. on the planet of Orphan 55. There they could spend as much time, I think it was about three weeks, enjoying fun in the sun in an enclosed environment on what is meant to be an inhospitable planet. Hmm. Something goes dangerously wrong. There are the faults popping up everywhere, viruses attacking everyone. And it turns out that the planet outside, the planet outside is very, very hostile extremely so it's become mm. filled with these strange creatures i can't remember what they were called dregs, dregs. dregs yeah. yes they're now the apex predator inhale carbon dioxide exhale oxygen mm. and is later revealed that they're oh, maybe the... spoiler on that spoiler, one yeah. yeah but let's just say uh maybe planet of the apes ish planet of the apes meets metro 2033 yeah i think this was the real dud in the season for me because as soon as they sort of get there, it's like it immediately just starts with the danger and the peril. Yes. Like, I mean, we've got previous episodes in previous seasons like Planet of the Ood where they show up and you, you do get a sense that something wrong is going on. It makes you feel uneasy. Yeah. It, it doesn't go to hell until, like, you know, 30 minutes in. Yep. Whereas this is like right off the bat, you don't even have a moment to like really settle or get an idea of what this place is really like. You just mm. see it. It's just, just it's just thrown at our face. Mm. Much. Even then, the plot itself and some of the characters are just terrible and generic. What is up with hyphen with a three? Oh, it, it literally yes. looks like she's wearing a, a really bad dog costume with Star Trek uniform. That's what it looks like to me. That was really weird because I'm like, is she meant to be an alien or is she yeah, just dressing up? I was like really confused. I was like, if, if she's trying, to, if they're, they're trying to make her look like an alien. They did not succeed no. at all. It, it just literally looked like someone who poorly dressed up as a dog. Maybe she is just a furry I mean, of the future. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's we just, don't judge, I mean, but yeah, it I was mean, the very makeup, terrible costume. The yeah. makeup on her just it did it, it back looked a like little a bit. kid literally could <laughs> have done school. that on her. Maybe that was homage to old Doctor Who, like bad costumes, maybe. I don't know. Uh, M- mind you, they probably spent all their money on the drag costume. Dread costumes looked really good. One, the main one was played by an actor called Spencer Wildling, who played Darth Vader in Rogue One. Just a really oh, big nice. um, character actor dude, lot, wears lots of costumes and stuff. Really cool aliens in that regard. Uh, main guest star in this was Laura Fraser, who's perhaps best known as Lydia from Breaking Bad. Uh, she's a Scottish actress, naturally. Oh, yeah. I thought she was just underused because I, I heard she was going to be in it and I was like, oh, that's going to be cool. Yeah, I was, and I was like sitting there, I was like, I know her from somewhere. I just can't put my finger on it. I thought there was a, a line the Doctor had towards the end and mild spoilers, I guess, towards the, the end, eventual reveal. I, I felt there was one line that the Doctor had which was very sort of um, relevant, I guess, to today, especially when this came out. You know, there was the big fire crisis across Australia, the wildfires. And it also came out just after the... Um 
what was it, the Climate Summit yeah. of yeah. Greta Thunberg. Yeah, so, I mean, who knows if it was planned, because, I mean, this would have been written well in advance of its air yeah. date, but it was quite relevant in that regard. Very relevant. Yeah. So the episode's called Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, where the Doctor and the gang team up with Nikola Tesla himself, and he, who is apparently being hunted down by the strange people who seem to be possessed by some kind of energy at which Tesla has as like a little device that has emitting a large energy and we come across a few characters like Thomas Edison and mm. I was like really I did not expect that and I actually quite like the dialogue in between them two as well I think that was really cool yeah I thought it was a really cool thing with the whole episode like my kind of issue with uh, with the episode was that the, the main villain I, I forgot her name but um, she was lackluster yeah she wasn't like significant like like you know how you, you, you gotta have like villains that are supposed to be like kind of bit like outstanding like mm. to, to towards our heroes and all that they gotta put like the fear in our heroes but you don't really kind of get that with this one she was very reminiscent she was like this giant scorpion lady she and she was very Ragnarok, i was about tenets. to say that <laughs> yeah uh previous alien species like just a giant spider lady yeah very scary played by sarah Parrish. i don't know the actress's name who played mm. this this villain, but she was um, previously in the Doctor Who spin-off, The Sarah Jane Adventures. Mm. And when she was announced, I thought, oh my God, they're going to bring in this character from The Sarah Jane Adventures. No, she's playing an alien creature buried under mountains of prosthetic. Mm. Um, Again, still harkening back to the old designs of classic Who, mm. to some degree, even though... Yeah. Uh, they were like scavenger aliens, these creatures, and she had like tyres over her shoulders as like pauldrons mm. and her armour. So it was like they were scavenging bits of different tech from different people mad max the alien pretty much yeah yeah i thought it was an interesting episode but it would have just been an okay episode i think in a regular series of doctor who mm. but because this you series don't need to throw aliens in with nikola tesla you've got enough there just with the idea of having tesla in the episode i, I do agree with that i think that's a common problem with this new doctor who is they don't have purely historical episodes anymore then, there's always some alien and the purely aspect. historical episode alien they or had dimension or creatures Park episodes last season there was still a sci-fi influence Elements. yeah so yeah. it's really frustrating on that regard because there is enough interesting stuff with tesla he's mm. like this he's brilliant the mad dude. inventor with, with various mental disorders yeah yeah played by a lot um, of stuff that was touched upon the season various mental disorders yeah that's actually a common theme across this season actually yeah is that so it's interesting for pointing that out uh we come to episode five the fugitive of the jadoon <sighs> This is an interesting episode. It's basically a return of the Jadoon, these, these rhino police from um, David Tennant's era. It, it sort of plays like the greatest hits of the Jadoon. They basically just do all the same stuff all over again, except they're now in this town in Gloucester. Uh, there's this lady who's caught up in it uh, called Ruth, mm. this uh, tour guide, and she gets involved, and it seems like her husband is being targeted by the Jadoon. And as we shifty. Yeah, as we learn, there's also the Time Lords are involved somehow. Um, Captain Jack Harkness, played by John Burrowman of Doctor Who previously, as well as the spin-off Torchwood, makes a glorious return, which he, he's, he's basically there to dump exposition. Mm -hmm. He's there to dump exposition and to remind us that some of the old companions are still around. Yeah, which is good because I kind of felt with this season that there was so much new stuff. Uh, ever since jody has been around, there's so much new stuff, it doesn't feel like there's much connective tissue. No, it doesn't feel like it's connected up to any of the, other... the old stuff, like yeah. with the um, previous New Year's special where the Dalek scout attacking Earth, you know, surely Unit and uh, Torchwood would have been on the job, but... yeah. Torchwood and Unit totally removed from the picture, and I mean the Dalek was completely new, so it was almost like a complete reboot in a way. And there were theories going around that this was an alternate reality, an alternate universe that the Doctor had dropped into because there was, it was just so different from what came before. Mm. And especially with this other big reveal, um, which we can't really do justice. I mean, I think the episode did it brilliantly. The reveal that this lady Ruth is actually. A time lord herself and not just any time lord she's the doctor previous or a future incarnation and there's this big question mark as even the doctor's like i don't understand what's going on because they're both like well i don't remember being you and the other one's like well I, I don't remember being you yeah which is where this whole alternate reality theory came from that this was like a doctor from an alternate universe i think it was my favorite episode it was at the time when i watched it it was like the first time i'd been really excited by it doctor who definitely edge of your seat interesting mm. Mm. and it made you ask more questions about why they're taking this series yeah whether that um unfolds 
we've well we we've seen, but you shall see, for we have already seen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Praxius. In the year twenty thirty, various different unconnected people are brought together from some greater conspiracy involving pollution and plastic and microplastics, and the doctor is at the centre of it. I think this is a strong episode that reminded me very much of The Sign of Three, which was a very strong Chris Chibnall written episode from a few years ago with Matt Smith. A lot of setup, a lot of potential, but it just sort of wraps up too quickly at the end. It also was a very, again, another interestingly timed episode because it based itself around a um, plastic based mm. virus mm. just as the coronavirus was hitting uh news headlines mm. oh yeah and that's I mean, right particularly seeing that they found what would be equating to be patient zero in hong kong oh gosh yeah that's that happens yeah oh that's true that's yeah. where they find patient zero in uh, some random sh- factory floor in hong kong oh wow yeah okay is that's it yeah. foresight or <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying the BBC went and manufactured It was all planned from the government. Oh, absolutely. The doctor who actually found out the actual, the actual plan and actually just put it on an episode. <laughs> Why not? Why not? It's I just think too well con- it's just convenient timing. It does, of course. Like. It does tie into the whole global warming thing. And I think this was a story that was done with... I think it was done better than the previous episode, Orphan 455. It had an interesting twist and an interesting idea behind it. But yeah. Again, I felt it was a very ham-fisted message, much like with Orphan 55. Yeah, I think it's really difficult to try and get that message across. Like, You can't even yeah. make mention of, like, oh, they're cutting down the trees. You can't even say that in a story without someone going, that's an environmentalist agenda. Like, don't get me wrong, sci-fi is, can be filled with agenda. It's oh, it, just, it always is. It's going to be done a little better. Yeah. I, I, I wonder if there is a way to do it. There really probably Better. is. We just haven't found it yet. Yeah, you need to be really clever to figure that one out. Can You Hear Me is a really interesting episode. I love Can You Hear Me. A mysterious man, humans being kidnapped, fiend fed nightmares, and a Actually, strange woman in an orb between an extinction level event of two planets colliding. You definitely love this episode. I adore <laughs> this episode. Yeah. yeah, really well done. And mm. interesting monster and. It's very interesting monster. You did a yeah, very good very. synopsis of that because I'm like, how do I describe this? There's so many elements to this. And it's really creepy. And we do get an exploration of the characters' psyches, mm. which we haven't really gotten to get a greater understanding of them mm. in some ways. Character, uh, I, f- I forgot his name. Uh, um, the bad guy? Yeah, the bad guy. Zalen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because he's one of the ancient gods from another universe or something like he's that. He's an immortal. And because uh, oh, I was thinking, okay, so what's this guy's deal? And uh, I'm like, oh, okay. So he raises his hand and, and fingers come off and then they just... I found it weird that the fingers actually go into people's ears. It, it, it's just... I find that even that even, really even cool. the sound effect, I'm yeah. like, Ugh, that's and creepy. That makes it sound like he's ripping his fingers off, but no, it's like they disconnect. Like there's no blood, there's no gore. They just like pop off and fly yeah. into people's ears. It's yeah. Yeah. really creepy imagery. And yeah. there's a lot going on in this. Like I think great set design and effects great as well. Set oh, design and very good and set design. A terrific bad guy. Yeah, and mm. I like I said, Old really classic Doctor Who villain. Type. Oh yeah. Granted, you know, Master, he gets, they get changed up every season that they pop up in, but it's usually the same thing. I will get you, Doctor, blah, blah, blah. This one, you have an ancient being who's just doing it because time has no meaning to him. Hmm. And it makes a beautiful reference to William Hartnell's era with the Celestial Toymaker. That's what I was thinking, Mm. yeah. A game board that even the Toymaker would be proud of. (laughs) The Haunting of Villa Diodati. How do you pronounce that? Yeah. How horrible is that? Yeah. The haunting of Villa Diodati sees the Doctor take her to companions to meet with Mary Shelley on the night that she would write the modern Prometheus, a.k.a. Frankenstein. Mm. Only there's something going on. Something... Something more. Something more. The, the house is changing and there's endless hallways and staircases and Mary Shelley's husband has just disappeared and there's this figure that stalks the halls and some creature which emerges from the lake and that creature is a cyberman mm. this is one of the doctor's oldest mm. foes it's a uh, it's a human who took away all their organic compounds and replaced them with Plus cybernetic metal yeah. cybernetic organism like yeah, although tech. his conversion actually isn't finished no he's his mask is like chipped away and you can see this pallid yeah. scarred human face below yeah. and he's 
Mm. Terrifying. Beautiful design. Oh, he was terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was actually, I was like, okay, I would not want to be near this guy at all. And it would be a beautiful thing, you know. It was a wonderful setup. Mary Shelley, the possibility of a haunted house, and a hodgepodged Cyberman, because his helmet is more of the more modern of this, of Jody's era. Hmm. His left arm is a Mondasian. His body is the last upgrade that they had, and I'm pretty sure the legs were from the Age of Steel. Yeah, from the David Tennant era. Mm. And what a and you could still see the man underneath. And what a beautiful idea to inspire the. Uh, I need to collect my thoughts because Shelley is a beautiful writer. Um, the woman who would invent mo- and begin the trend of modern science fiction mm. and horror. Mm. I think there was definitely. A really strong connection there. Mm. Somewhat left a little like it just uh, threads sort of fell to the wayside. Yeah, yeah, threads left loose at the end. So that was a little disappointing, but strong setup for something. It was a strong which was coming into the finale. Yeah, but it started to dip off a little bit mm. to try and establish the finale. It's sort of like I said, it left it hanging, and mm. Mary Shelley never actually writes the thing. It would almost be like interrupting J.K. Rowling before she gets on that train and thought up Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. Yeah. It's, or, you know, stopping Ian Fleming from writing James Bond. Yeah, so mm. it sort of feels like they've really messed with history Yeah, by well, doing that, yeah. Well, because when I was watching the episode, I felt it was just a bit slow, but as soon as the Lone Simon showed up, I was like, oh, okay, okay, we're, we're in business here. I'll, and the I'll, idea I'll of the house. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was wonderful, and then the sci-fi element came, like, damn it, <laughs> let me have a haunted house, please. But then at the end, oh, it might have been all along. Yeah, that, yeah. that was a weird little... It's like, really? Thing. Don't, don't say that it might have been, because, you know, well, either do the, the supernatural thing or do sci-fi. Well, if you can't find that good middle ground, don't do it. Yeah, because, you know, like, you have one scene where you have a skeleton hand just crawling on the floor, and then you have Ryan and a few others, and they're like, what's that? And then and then Ryan's like, I think it's a hand. And then it jumps up. It's like, it's like hand. It's definitely a hand. <laughs> I actually, really, I, Ryan? I, how many fingers is it holding up? I mean, like, I laughed at that because I just just his reaction. That I thought it was really funny, which doesn't make sense actually when you think about it. Like, why the hand was moving? We won't spoil that, but why the hand was moving is like, why was that happening? Yeah, why was it trying to kill Ryan? That doesn't make sense. Going into the finale, the ascension of the Cyberman. Yeah, this the Cyberman Ashard is his name. Really terrifying. Like he has two moments where he does sort of like a bait and switch, where he seems to be talking about something, and then he turns on a dime Mm. so in the previous episode he went and saved this baby and hid him away and mary shelley goes and says to him like you went and saved my child so surely you still have some humanity within him within you so he does talk a bit about his family like how he had children when he was you know when he was human and it seems like he's having this moment where he's letting the human emotions flood back in and then he turns on a dime and he's just like, and then I slit their throats because they got in my way. Yay! It, it was like... Crazy sad man. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very crazy. I was just like, oh, he, even though he couldn't be any more terrifying. Jeez. We do get a bit of that as well where Jody go, like the doctor goes to him. You're only half converted. You've still got this humanity within you. And he's like, well, yes, I, I am different and I'm not complete, but that's because I'm better. <laughs> and I will bring glory to the Siberian. And it's mm. like, okay. <laughs> you've done something with that the duality of a creature mm. that relies on destroying the other part to become what it is he's so. very passionate and very filled with hate he's yeah. very fueled by emotions yeah. and yet it works in his favour which is wonderful but he's very reminiscent of the cult of Scarrow of mm. the Daleks who were like this elite group of Daleks who were created with emotions and thoughts who could dream up new ideas and come up with how to kill better yeah or or even to survive you Mm. know and that's kind of what he is in a way Mm. but he's done in a different way that's quite unique i think what i liked about um essentially the simon was the 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 very beginning where we have we just i just added nowhere we have this this guy who's on a bike and he finds this baby just sitting there on the road it's just a little heartwarming kind of thing i was like like, i'm like at first i was like what's going on here but then i was and i was just like yeah actually that's actually kind of nice it's actually heartwarming and i I can get by that and then like watching the rest of the episode i was like why were they showing us that well 
And it explains in the finale, but what I liked about the Ascension of Cybermen was the bleakness of the Cyber Wars. Mm. Very reminiscent of the comic The Flood. Yes, which we talked a bit about before we started recording, mm. which just saw an almost total decimation of humanity. And Did anyone think that the Cyber Drones sounded a bit like TIE Fighters? A little. I found it hilarious that they were just Cyberheads. Yeah, I, I, thought, <laughs> I was like, really? You couldn't think of a design or With anything like that? Laser eyes. Laser eyes. Makes cyber sense, heads floating in the air. I, I, too, uh, it would have been cool to see them, like you know, pop off the body and then fly off and then come back and that would be terrifying. Land back on. Yeah, that see, that would have worked better. Because that was the thing. Cybermen were originally just the brains with some samples of mm. organic material, but in more recent years they've just become conversions. Yeah, just yeah. men in suits, which was tying back to a, a, an episode of Torchwood. Cyberwoman did something really weird with Cybermen, where it sort of t- tried to established that Cybermen were being desperate and were just slamming cybernetic pieces onto a human rather than ripping the brains out. Yeah. Compare that to the half Cybermen we get in this, a shard. It's just leagues ahead of that and sort of what we've seen before. To talk a little bit about the finale, the Timeless Children, which was, yeah, previously marketed as the the Timeless Child. It's an interesting one, to say that much. It has definitely caught my attention. It didn't hold me like, can you hear me? Hmm. Yes, the, the Ascension of the Cybermen was interesting. It was bleak. It was, quite frankly, part of the opposite of what Jody's series have been, which has mm. been sort of hopeful. It was a genuine bleakness to it, and then it adds in wonderful elements and makes you question, what do we really remember of the ancient Gallifreyan lore? And then it does the sh- stupidest, more fatty and twist that, ah, oh, I nearly stopped there. <laughs> I think with Doctor Who is that there's so much lore that you can just... I think Peter Capaldi even said you like it's like a pick and mix. You can sort of choose mm. what you want to be canon. And this goes back 44 years to something that was established back in the 70s, which I thought had been long forgotten about, something I chose to sort of ignore, and now it's put it out there. And it's sort of now giving us a choice of, like, do we accept this or do we move on from this? Is it going to play too much into what's going to happen in the future? I'll accept it, but it could have been done bloody better. These episodes just seem to fly by. Mm. Like, compared to previous seasons, it's sort of... You had, like, a 50-minute movie, and they could pack so much in, but these ones just they feel like they're... in the wrong spot. How do we feel about this season as a whole, compared to Jodie's first series, the 13th Doctor's first series? It's still first a mixed bag for me. There's only a few good episodes, and I can't even remember what the good one was for last season. Uh, I'm pretty much in the same boat with Josh. I'm pretty mixed. And they had a lot of good ideas, which I was really glad. Well, this season showed that they actually still have some, so I'm like, okay, they've got some life in them. So that's our review of Series 12 of Doctor Who. Tune into the finale tonight on ABC at 7.30 or catch up on iView. This has been The Geeks Review. I'm Royce. I'm Ben. And I'm Joshua. We'll see you next time.